The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room that's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, my name is Andrew Rocks, and welcome to another edition of the Engine Room Podcast. Today, I'm really thrilled to be sitting down with David Heinz. David, I have known for many years and I've admired from afar initially when he ran quite a successful uh, financial holistic and goals-driven financial advice business. I met, I, I caught up with him overseas on, on a conference and uh, was really thrilled when it came out in the press recently that he was sort of the oversight for a large company coming into Australia. So without any further ado, welcome to the Engine Room Podcast, David. Well, thanks, Roxy. I, I just want to make sure I'm able to call you uh, Roxy and not Andrew, if that's all right. Uh, well, um, Andrew is what my mum, um, my wife, and uh, the magistrate um, uses. So um, unless you're planning on being one of those three things, Dave, but never say never, um, we probably run with Roxy. How's that sound? I'll take that as permission. Good to be here. <laughs> so I was, um, you know, I was having a bit of a, a, you know, we've been doing this engine room for a while and we've been talking about the best practice and 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 over the course of it, we've noticed that the way in which financial planning has arranged itself from a licensing tech stack, um, you know, COVID drove quite a lot of innovations, has changed. And it had to change because legislation went really fast. And I feel that we're on our heels for a while. So I'm really interested in, first of all, learning a bit about, and my listeners would love to learn a bit about, you know, your backstory, because you genuinely are from our side, the coalface side of financial services in Australia, and then parlaying into the exciting venture that you're with as we speak with the Merchant Group. Roxy, thank you. Um, as I say, great to be here. And obviously, my objective is to add some value to the listeners, so that's that's certainly the intent. Uh, look, probably my least favourite subject talking about myself, but I think to set the scene and give us some context... I'm 33 years in wealth management. I started my own firm in 89, and I'll talk about a couple of the uh, key epiphanies along that journey in a moment. But, um, you know, we grew a good firm. We, we won uh, a couple of awards, which we're very proud of, Financial Planning uh, Business of the Year in 2004, as an example. Um, we then merged to create Shadforth Financial Group in 2008. Now, I don't want to say that too quickly because it was a 13-way simultaneous merger on the 2nd of April 2008. We took uh, 13 firms, three in Brisbane, three in Sydney, three in Melbourne, one in Tassie and two in Perth, and merged them together uh, in April 2008. Now, day one, that was 80 million revenue, 25 million EBIT. Um, we grew that firm from 2008 through 2014 to 160 million revenue and 58 million EBIT. Um, and got taken over by IWF in late 2014. Since that time, I have been, so I was 42 when we merged to create Shadforth, 48 when we got taken over. I didn't want my kids thinking I was a lazy bum, so I consulted from 2015, and I've been working with advice firms around the world. 
uh, because I was based in Melbourne, Australia, 27 years running an advice firm, I wanted to do something that was global in nature. Um, I wanted to do something that was a lot of a better term, wholesale, not re- retail, sort of dealing with two or three or four clients, not with 100 or 200 clients. And I wanted to help advisors to understand the real value that they bring to the table other than the stock picking, uh, market timing, dart throwing, uh, more around the above the line outcome on sort of goals and and uh, client experience, et cetera, et cetera. And look, curiously, uh, you know, having that international perspective, when you went, so you had your kit bag, you were obviously very well versed in, in, in the Australian financial planning uh, landscape. When you went overseas, what were a couple of the real, I suppose, differences and learnings that you, you had and from which countries? So in, in 2017, I was in 19 countries as far and wide as Germany, uh, Norway, Africa, etc. cetera. Um, I think there's a hell of a lot that we should be proud of as an industry in Australia. If we are not the leading advice firm, we are one of the leading advice firms in the world, unquestionably in my mind. And, and, and I, I do hear and see you know, a lot of negativity around royal commissions, et cetera, et cetera. And I, and I get that because we have a superannuation system that is the envy of the world with you know, in excess of $4 trillion dollars. We're, we're highly regulated, uh, but we are doing so many things right in this country uh, that I- in many cases, you know, I was in Hong Kong two weeks ago, Singapore two months ago, we're probably, you know, respectfully 20 years in front of some of those countries with our value proposition and our professionalism. Now, are, are we there yet? Are we perfect? Not by any stretch. And we've got some way to go, but we're, we're doing a lot of things right. And I think as an advisory group, we should be very proud. So is it fair to say that your children think you've got a job now, Dave, and you're not you're not lazy, or or is that just the the biggest throwaway line? Considering I know just how driven you are. Yeah, look, um, it, it, you know, as an old saying, Roxy, if you love what you do, you never work another day in your life. And, and I love what I do. I love the industry. I had a chance to pivot in 2015 to do something different, and chose uh, because I just love this this industry, this emerging profession so much. It's great to be playing an active role in that. Which brings me to um, you know the the, the 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 next question was, so you were consulting around the world and and, and you've you formed the opinion, um, and I imagine with some pride when you're in other countries you would would relay what's happening back in in you know your motherland Australia. At what stage did you get the inkling that other countries were interested in in not just um, sort of our learnings but actually investing into us? Well, um, when you think so, firstly study quite closely some of the more advanced markets in the world, which would be the UK and the US, um, looking at the multiples that are being paid for practices or businesses in those countries. Uh, If you take the US as an example, there's some 35 private equity firms that are set or looking to get set within wealth management because of the high regulation, uh, because of the annuity income stream, because there's a natural tailwind called the stock market. And if you overlay that with Australia, with our compulsory superannuation system, you know, moving through 11, 12 percent, uh, it, it is an incredible industry, uh, not only from a client perspective, and, and we need to make it a great industry for our team members and, and staff members as well. But if shareholders get it right, it can be an incredibly rewarding uh, investment to run an advice firm as well. So I guess watching particularly, Roxy, what was happening in the US with M&A, not just with private equity, but with M&A as well, um, was uh, an obvious area that I looked at, but also seeing the multiples that were being paid in those countries. And you know, we can perhaps talk about that a little bit later on, but it is a highly sought after industry uh, to partner with uh, a high growth firm. And I know you don't like talking about um, y- yourself, but you know, you did spend 25 years to become an overnight success um, when you when you did that transaction. Um, throughout those years, what were the what were the moments or the aha moments for you at the coalface um, that that I suppose formed the way you think about investing and the way you think about financial advice practices? Well, look, firstly, uh, I, I want to make it crystal clear that notwithstanding we sold Shadforth for just under 700 million Aussie dollars, I had a lot of incredibly skilled and talented partners and team members. Um, you know, I played a small role in that, uh, just like any premiership football team does. Um, but we had a lot of great people 
And so I, I think if there was, you know, I'd, I'd love to come out with some epiphanies for the listeners today, but perhaps just to remind them of some of the key points that if you're looking for success, surround yourself with great people. And and certainly Shadfall Financial Group was uh, not married at first sight. You know, most of those firms knew each other for eight or 10 or 12 years, were networked together, you know, perhaps starting off with copies, moving to red wines and and ultimately saying that the the sum of the parts can equal uh, the individual components and and that's why we we pull that together. So I think epiphanies would be uh, get yourself uh, surrounded by great people, focus on the client, focus on the client outcome. You know, I ask a lot of financial advisors, are we crystal clear on the problem that we are trying to solve for our prospective clients? I think too often we have a uh, preordained solution being uh, assets and under management or risk insurance or mortgages or whatever it might be, rather than asking the right questions, um, working out what their goals and aspirations are and delivering on that. So, you know, great people, client experience. I think there was a couple of, of key pivots for me, um, recognizing from the UK in the mid 90s, you know, the godfather of lifelong cash flow modeling was a guy called Paul Etheridge, who I would have passed away uh, 12, 18 months ago. But I would regard him as the as the uh, you know the grandfather of of you know true real lifelong well, cash flow modeling. One hundred percent. I actually in the nineties had a CD of him talking, and I would listen right. to it. Um, absolutely. absolutely. Keep going, Paul Etheridge. Um, what we might do, um, sound guys, we might um put a Paul Etheridge link, um, as one of the assets or one of the nuggets out of here as well. So I totally agree. So so what what took you with Paul Etheridge's um philosophy? Well, what took me was that. It, it, of course, if people had a choice to get an 8% return or a 10% return or a 12% return, of course they'd all take the 12%. But is that what they need? Is that enough? Is it not enough? Is it too much? And, and you know, what you learned from Paul was money is just a means to an end. Uh, you know, what's important to you in your life? You know, what's important about money? What are your goals and aspirations? And, and what I learned from Paul was that there's only three possible scenarios when you model every possible permutation and combination. One is that you're going to die with way too much money. Uh, one is that you are going to uh, run out of money well before you die. Or the, or the other one is the Goldilocks scenario that's just right and, and your, your money expires just after you expire. And now a lot of people say, oh, well, modeling out goals and aspirations, it's built on a whole bunch of assumptions. Well, Better to work on some basic assumptions than not to work on any assumptions at all would be my view. Yeah, look, if, if, if you and that's that's very much that that coach, very much that that planning mentality, which which I think um, as 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 you've intimated, um, you know, the birthplace of uh, financial advice was quite um, product based in in this country, and and we lost our way, and we've had a big reset over the last ten years, and I believe, um, as I imagine you do, that's we're all talking. That that we've we've come full circle, and the client is genuinely the centre of of the universe um, as far as uh, Australian financial services businesses. Yeah, just changing gears a second. Your observation of both the UK and the USA markets. What's the difference of the licensing regimes in both of those compared to Australia? Just just to give some context before we go into what you're doing now. Look, I think the key difference that I would see particularly in the US, is if someone engages a financial advisor, there is no requirement to do a statement of advice and the advisor has discretion over the money. So, you know, what does that mean in an efficiency perspective? You know, in Australia, if you divide any firm's revenue turnover by their full-time equivalents, their headcount, you know, typically the answer is going to be around $200,000 of revenue per full-time equivalent. In the US, because of the efficiencies that they have with discretion and no SOAs, they're running at nearly double that, $350,000 of revenue per full-time equivalent. So they're way more efficient um, because they've got, I guess, an easier proposition, but they're nowhere near as comprehensive and holistic as we are in Australia, looking at um, you know, really uh, being a coach, mentor, advisor, and project manager for our clients, like many advisors in Australia are. So if you're saying that Australians give a better outcome, but it's harder to make a buck, do you think that America, is, for instance, USA is going to have higher regulation or do you think that we're going to have sort of a slight deregulation or even, even just create genuine efficiencies so that we can get those 
that 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 sort of revenue per FTE up? Well, look in Australia, anecdotally, fifty percent of fees being charged now are flat dollar fees, fixed fees. Uh, in the US, that would be ninety nine percent AUM fees. So I, I think what you'll see, you know, one of my favourite sayings, Roxy, you'll hear me say many times, is that cost is only an issue in the absence of value. You know, I think the Australian financial advisors have become very good, uh, not perfect, but very good at adding value and articulating their value. We need to get better and better at that. But I think we are a mile in front of other advisors, US advisors that are very much an investment-based proposition and not necessarily looking at things comprehensively and holistically. And as they start to get margin squeeze, I mean, you've got a population of 360 million people. So there's not the same uh, you know, pressures on the advisors as there is in Australia. But as those pressures come, I think you'll see them doing more and more for their value proposition and for their margins. So um, we spoke a couple of weeks ago and um, you kind of gave me the overview that I knew that you would you had teamed up with Merch, and I think they hit the press maybe about six months ago. I knew things were coming, um, but it looks like that the, that you, you're, you're actually about to, or you have already pulled the trigger. So I've done a bit of research on the overall Merchant Group, and and uh, they've got six guiding principles, um, which is integrity, collaboration, entrepreneurship, alignment, vision, and perseverance, which do resonate with what I know you are as a person. I'm pretty sure that you could have picked many partners to work with as an ambassador in this country. Why did you specifically choose this particular organization? You know, Roxy, look, it's a great question. I, I mean, firstly, um, you know, we got a great outcome with Shadforth 2014. I was very happy consulting the last eight years, uh, you know, very busy. It wasn't broke. It was really only looking for a solution for one of my Sydney-based clients that I became really clear on the multiples in the US. And, and I looked at some of the models in Australia that were typically buying majority controlling positions and saw a different model. I saw a model that took significant minority positions. And, and I think the, so the significant minority, you know, one of the things that I believe is that you don't want to turn entrepreneurs into employees. If you've got great businesses that are growing, and you remove the entrepreneurs from those businesses, that can be highly problematic. So the significant minority position, typically 20 25%, ticked a really big box for me. Uh, the other big box that got ticked was looking at US multiples compared to Australian multiples. And with that 20 to 25% uh, partnership stake that gets taken, uh, Merchant offers a tag along, which is the right but not the obligation to tag into a future liquidity event at US multiples. And so I thought, gee whiz, you know, there are a couple of really key differences. Um, the other big difference was whilst merchant is private in nature and merchant takes an equity position, so one might uh, you know, ascertain that merchant is a PE firm, it's not a traditional PE firm like a, a, a fund where there's a seven-year window, seven, seven-year shot clock, uh, the PE firm's got to come in, strip out expenses, gear it up, and try and flip it. It's it's long term patient capital taking a 10, 15 year view. There's no shot clock. And so that combination combined, Roxy, of the significant minority not turning entrepreneurs to employees, the tag along provision, and, and offering the partners a second or third bite of the cherry. When you look at some of the models around out there, if there is any upside, it's for. The um, it's for the private equity firm, um, and and good luck to them. But in the merchant model, um, there's a second bite of the cherry when there's an IPO where the partner firm has a chance to tag into the IPO at US multiples. Uh, but they're also still left with some script running the company, and so looking for some succession internally with Gen two and Gen three is important as well. So to answer your question, what why why am I doing this? Um, because I, I, I saw such a, a different and unique model that I was uh, very keen to bring it to Australia and get involved in it. And, and when we're in discussions, you've been talking about big companies that you've been involved with, but ultimately they started as small companies, your own business, which I believe was, which suburb in Melbourne were you based, David, from memory? Uh, well, oh, uh, Collins Street, Melbourne. Collins Street, uh, but... so right in the middle. So, so your business started there, you, you, you kicked off many years ago. Um, 
What are the types? And you mentioned that um, you know the genesis of reaching of, of of learning about Merchant was one of your Australian based clients. You were looking for a solution. First question is having this particular you know a minority non controlling strategic and co- collaborative equity capital partnership structure. If you had your time again, would that be something that would have appealed to you back in the tender days when you were in your early forties, or is that kind of part of your motivation? It's a great question. Um, you, you know, I think the the Shadforth Group had me at hello because of the great people. Um, and, and with any business, you need to design whatever solution you're looking for around what your goals and aspirations are for that business. Now, with Shadforth, uh, I was the youngest of the village elders, uh, 42 when we, when we moved, 48 when we sold. But most of my partners were sort of early, mid, late 50s. And so, you know, if, if, if you divide 80 million revenue and 25 million EBIT by 13 firms, you know, the average firm was six or seven million, two or three million EBIT. Uh, and so the valuation of those firms was typically in the sort of 12 to $20 million range. And they didn't really, they, they left their internal succession too long to get a Gen 2 and Gen 3 coming through. It was too expensive. Um, they couldn't borrow enough money. So Shadforth was always designed as a liquidity event. Uh, to answer your question, would I have done things differently? Maybe, maybe. Um, I think the merchant model definitely uh, is best suited to a younger entrepreneur with runway, not an older entrepreneur um, for those reasons. No, and that was a self-serving question as well. As you know, I exited a business um, roughly the same age at about 44. And um, and uh, because uh, back then there was an absence of this. Now, so tell me, um, you, you know, we're throwing out minority, non-controlling. What kind of business are you looking for? Let's get down to the engine room or the coal face. If I'm an advice practice that's that's doing, you know, six million turnover and two million EBIT, is that is that in the ballpark? Are you looking for something bigger? Are you looking for specialists? If you can give us a feel for what floats yeah. your boat at the coal face, then a lot of people are listening along might go, you know what? I've got runway. Um, I'm don't really need, you know, I've got myself into a good financial position, but maybe I need, might need some custom credit solutions as you pertain to offering um, as an example. So what are the types of businesses, David? So, Roxy, if I could just maybe back up the truck for a couple Go of minutes and, and, and then help to set the scene because I think it's really important to get the macro right before we get the micro. You, you know, it's my view as a business person for 27 years and an advisor to advisors the last eight years that any any principle or business should have what I call a, a VCP or a value creation plan. And that value creation plan has got four key levers. You know, the first lever, everyone's trying to achieve it. That is to increase revenue. Well, we all get that. The second one is to maintain or decrease expenses. We all get that. We're all doing that. You know, that's trying to deliver an enhanced EBIT with higher revenue or the same or lower costs. Lever three is to get some reasonable and appropriate balance sheet leverage. So if you can borrow money a year or two years ago at 4%, or even today, if you can borrow money at 8%, but buy a book or buy a business at the right price, you, you, the cost of capital is today 8%, but your return on investment is closer to 15%. So the third lever is getting appropriate leverage. You know, there's the best business people are saying, you know, it's pretty simple maths, Roxy. He's saying, hey, I can borrow money at 8 I get a 15% uh, ROI. I'll do that every day of the week until I run out of runway. I, you know, the bank's not going to lend me any more money or I feel uncomfortable putting my head on a pillow. The fourth, the fourth lever is what I call prudent multiple expansion. Now, my small business pre-Shadforth was probably worth, you know, five or six or seven times EBIT. We were able to double the EBIT from 25 million to 58 million. And we ended up getting taken over or let, let's just round the figures out to 12 times EBIT. So we, we essentially got a, a greater than 20, 20 times multiplier on our, uh, on our business as opposed to a five or a six or seven times. So it was a four-time multiplier because we had a very clear value creation plan strategy around those four levers, including the fourth lever of prudent multiple expansion. So yeah, part, of, part of my coaching to my advice uh, business clients is, What's your value creation plan? Let's get a value creation plan in place. And that's where it really led me to the merchant model uh, was that, you know, we were looking for that solution and, uh, and, and here we are now, mate. So, it, it, you know, perhaps I, I pivot to say, 
uh, you know, what are the types of firms we're looking for? Well, you know, it, it, first and foremost, it would be entrepreneurs. You know, we are looking for entrepreneurs that want to grow. I have no issue with people who want to play golf or go fishing uh, or do whatever they want to do in their own time. But if they don't have a growth focus and vision, they're probably not going to be the right partner for us. I mean, why would they take on a capital partner if they're not looking to grow? Yeah, and and you mentioned you've got them with the four levers. You know, most people get sort of stuck in lever one and two. Some people go out there and 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 buy, you know, leverage their balance sheet. But historically, that was done in such a poor way, especially with large licensees. And prudent, prudent multiple expansion, as you intimated, if you get that right, it actually doubles the outcome at, at the very last, you know, the last sort of twenty meters of the hundred meter race. So, right, right. Why do you think people? Uh, haven't embraced that, and maybe has there just been? Um, is it just been totally sort of Australian licensee based in the past? I think typically the view in the past has been the only way to get that multiple expansion was either to merge and get bigger or to list on the ASX. And, and you do see a number of you know relatively small firms that are listed on the ASX with market caps at twenty, thirty, forty million. I mean, they they it's a tough space. You know, it's costing you. Two million to five million bucks a year to run a listed company, and and so I think people, you know, the concept of a value creation plan may be simply and effectively articulated by me today, but it's not rocket science, Roxy. I mean, people have been out looking for that multiple expansion, but I I think they've typically tried to achieve that by uh, merging and growing or by by listing, and and I think there's a, another way to tap into offshore multiples. And how long? Um, so you started working with Merchant. What in a consulting capacity until both parties were comfortable with the process, and um, when did you start deploying uh, or, or co-investing? As you say, what actually what's the terminology that you use? Because it is you do take a minority in all controlling state. What's the language that you like to use? So, so for us, we're very very clear. They're partnerships. partnerships. Right? They're not they're not they're not deals. They're not transactions. They are partnerships. We are taking a long term partnership approach. We don't need or want a board seat, but we want our phone numbers to be on speed dial and we want to roll our sleeves up and get our feet under the desk and help that firm to grow. So um, partnerships is what we do. Um, we would like to think we're bringing an enormous amount more to the table other than just writing out a check. Right. And um, interestingly, you did mention something that piqued my, what my, my interest in. You, you mentioned you don't like to take a board uh, seat. Is that all part of the philosophy of backing the entrepreneur or because- you know, historically, anyone who's put money into anything wanted to be able to have their hands on the control wheel. Yeah, look, we, we want to bag entrepreneurs and get out of their way. Um, I'm not suggesting we don't want minority protection, so we want to agree on a budget and we'll, we'll give some 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 uh, uh, you know some barriers around that. You know, either way, we'll give some barriers around um, you know M and A expenditure, et cetera, et cetera. But we we, we want to help. You know, ideally, as a as a as an expansion capital partner. More often than not, we are going to be issuing more shares. It won't be a sell down. More often than not, it'll be issuing more shares. Money goes on the balance sheet. Money goes in the bank account, and they've got some dry powder to go and make some further acquisitions. We get out of their way. So that's the plan. Now we're open to what the US calls secondary, where there's some vendor sell down or a combination of expansion capital and vendor sell down. But ultimately, you're right, Roxy. We're backing entrepreneurs, and we want to get out of their way. So, so we're happy to take a board seat, but it's not a requirement. What we're more interested in doing is helping our partner firms to grow. And I suppose one of the segues were I was actually interviewing um, a Drew um, from MBS only a couple of weeks ago, and he, he kind of revealed that um, you guys were in discussions, and I believe, I'm not sure if that's been consummated yet, but um, and, and I know him personally, I know Chris and the team there personally, and they've got no intention of taking the foot off the pedal. Is that the kind of firm that that... that appeals to you or is that uh, or, or how did you come to make that sort of relationship well if, if i just perhaps bang out sort of four or five key points as to what we're looking for Perfect. and then come back to mbs and talk about why mbs so yeah we're, we're looking for entrepreneurs that want to grow uh, not what the u.s would call white flag businesses where a, a 64 and a half year old puts up the white flag and says you know i'm done i've had enough so as as a result of that sort of entrepreneurs looking at growth Typically, we're talking to entrepreneurs in that sort of 35 to 55 range uh, that have got some runway and have got some vision. 
you know, the people that we're talking to are either at a sort of enterprise stage or emerging enterprise stage. They've got some scale. You know, typically they've been active in inorganic growth, so they're doing okay organically, but they're also doing some inorganic growth. They've got a C-suite that's capable to execute on merger and acquisition uh, to extract the synergies. As a result of doing that, typically the firms we're talking to have got some debt on their balance sheets, in some cases quite a lot of debt. But the overriding point is we invest in people and character. You know, we want people with the right mindset, the right vision, and, and aligned values. So if we if we then pivot and say, why MBS? Well, that entrepreneurs focused on growth. You know, Drew, Drew and Chris and the team didn't want to sell down any shares. They wanted to double down on their expansion. So we, we've issued them with expansion capital. You know, they, they've already got some significant size and scale, but they're getting bigger. Um, we actually consummated that partnership about eight or nine weeks ago, but uh, the team quite understandably, because they have so many joint venture partners, wanted to get around and talk to all those partners first before it was announced. Now, in that time, because we've given them some dry powder, in that time, they've made a further two acquisitions. Um, and so you know, we, we want to help firms that are dead set keen and focused on expanding. And, and, and so they are the perfect candidate to tick all of our boxes, great people, very proud to be their partner. Um, and we would like to think we can help them to grow for the next five to 15 years. And what I've taken out of that is I love the term white flaggers and uh, there's, some, there's more Lexi in there. Now, you mentioned that you're interested in, in firms that are quite unquote enterprise scale. So does that, uh, is that uh, a function of um, their, their existing EBIT or, or, or revenue or headcount? Just to, to give me a, a bit of a feel, um, because there'll be people listening here who sort of, you know, start drinking the Kool-Aid and go, yep, we, we want a runway, we want that. I wonder what the enterprise scale definition in your mind would be? Yeah, well, look, well, firstly, I'd love, I'd love our phone to be ringing off the hook with people wanting to, uh, you know, just have a chat with Merchant. But what I would say, if you look at those four levers, uh, the third lever, you know, let's not disregard that third lever and that's uh, appropriate balance sheet leverage. You know, if, if some of the listeners out there haven't exercised M&A, um, then, you know, if, if they're genuinely entrepreneurial and growth focused, you know, working on the assumption that, well, let's go back a step. Top quartile firms are growing at 15% compound, right? 15% compound means that a firm's going to be doubling every five or six years. Yep. So if you look at that 15% compound growth, you, you know, it doesn't really matter whether that's coming organically or inorganically, but the bigger you get, the harder it is to maintain that 15% growth organically, right? So I'd be saying to the listeners, think about your growth rates. Think about how you're going in relation to those growth rates. Uh, the bigger you get, the more you might need to look at M&A uh, to help you with that inorganic kick along towards that 10 or 15% compound growth. So a couple of points there, Roxy. I probably didn't answer your question. No, no, not at all. And look, I, I, what I'm just jumping on now is, um, you know, you want people to potentially have some balance sheet leverage, but there's been such a narrow offering of credit providers to financial services over the last 20 years. And and if they are listing, we appreciate you having a go. But are you saying that when you come in, you also assist with with that that credit, or do you work with the Australian counter counterparts, the traditional, um, you know, offering banks like Macquarie, Judo, um, Dab, etc.? Yeah. So what what I'm saying is our typical target partner has ex executed on M and A, and as a result, has some debt. Yep. That we would obviously help where we can in that space as well. Um, with exactly the people you mentioned, you know, the Macquaries, the Gitos, the Nabs, the Westpacs of the world. Uh, for, either directly not Westpac, or sorry. Sorry. Man. I'm sure I'll get a nudge from the Westpac BDM, but anyway, off you go. Sorry. But you, your question a few moments ago was what, what does enterprise and emerging enterprise look like? Yeah. Well, it, you know, it, it's, a, it's an open conversation. We, we don't really want to be pushed on a dollar figure, um, but you're going to, I know, so I'll give you a dollar figure. But, you know, broadly... What's more important for us is um, entrepreneurs, uh, people, character. You know, the very first firm that Merchant partnered with in Austin, Texas in 2016 uh, was $400 million of assets under management seven years ago. Today, that firm's $8 billion of assets under management. So wow. they can be small with the right entrepreneurial nature and get a, a great outcomes. But again, Roxy, if you pushed us on a number, we'd probably say a million dollars EBIT 
to make it worth the while of the of the due diligence, the analysis, the conversations, you know, recognising that true partnerships can take anywhere in the order of six to nine months to consummate. There's a lot of a lot of work to be done. So I guess there needs to be, you know, a reasonable outcome for all parties. Yeah, agreed. Look, when you're talking about the the, the people and um you know, um, I've always got a section in my my engine room about people and culture, and 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 at the end of the day, you're investing in 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 people, and you're investing in the leader's vision, and you're enhancing that. Um, what what are the kind of um attributes? So the personal attributes that you personally identify in the the CEO of firms that you would like to partner with? I think they've got a, a clear vision. Um, they're not necessarily coming in. Uh, cold, uh, you know, green fields. They've got some experience. They've got a track record. You know, whether it was in a previous business uh, or or whether it's in the existing business. You take the late great Tony Fenning, who was the CEO of Shadforth Financial Group. Uh, you know, when I knew that Tony was coming in to run Shadforth, you know, that was a massive tick for me to be backing him as an entrepreneur that had taken Tyne and McKenzie to great heights. Yeah, you know, we're coming into Spring Racing Carnival time at Roxy, and so. You know, when you do the form, not that I'm a, bet, a betting man, but you do the form and you look at a horse that's in the right stable, it's got the right jockey, it's run over the distance, it's one in the wet and the dry, um, and, and I guess that's what you're looking for. You're looking for the entrepreneur that's that's got a track record. And with that, um, and I opened up the conversation with sort of the new wave of, of financial advice models. In relation to licensing, which used to be, you know, the the Rosetta Stone or the governing principle of all financial services in Australia, can I am I right in assuming that you're completely agnostic, or do you have a preference for self licensed, or or what what what's kind of because that informs me as to in a roundabout way of asking you what your vision for the future is, to be honest. Yeah, so so the merchant model is agnostic on uh, you know custodian platform investment model. Uh, you know, we're talking to firms that are pure direct equity, that are passive, that are active. Some are platformed, some aren't platformed. Um, in relation to licensing, uh, again, we're agnostic on that. The only thing we're not ag- agnostic on is vision, entrepreneurship, and 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 growth aspirations, right? So you can you can tick any of those boxes as long as that's what you're looking for. Now, it just so happens that a lot of the firms we're talking to are. Uh, you know, enterprises or emerging enterprises, and as a result of that, many of them are north of three million, five million, ten million, twenty million, thirty million, fifty million dollars in revenue. And so, if we if we look through our conversations, the overwhelming majority are self-licensed, but there's some excellent firms that we're talking to that are under licensee models as well. So, agnostic on all of that, Roxy. And what about the notion of specialists? Well, you you obviously are investing in specialists because we disclose the MBS. Um, um, in partnership, um, but what about the the notion of a one stop shop or a multi discipline practice, and and is that something that is common in the United States, which is the I suppose the birthplace of nurture? Yeah, well, well I mean, firstly, I've only been doing this for thirty three years, and I, and I say that you know partially tongue in cheek. I, I I thought I knew many of the advice firms around, and every week would be connected with a firm that I haven't met or that I haven't heard of. And so there's a lot of great firms out there, and you know, it doesn't matter whether you're uh, you know, active, passive, uh, uh, platform, non-platformed. There are different models out there that are doing extremely well. I mean, MBS is a risk insurance pure play, um, and as more and more advisors are saying, it's too hard, underwriting's too hard. Um, uh, you know, I can't I can't get stuff through the system, or I don't want to be receiving any commissions because I want to be independent, and impartial. They 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 are now. Uh, you know, enterprise style risk only. So we, we would talk to mortgage only. We would talk to uh, you know wealth only, uh, integrated tax accounting and wealth. Um, and and we're starting to have a chat to some pure tax and accounting players as well. So um, I think the the issue is not so much. Well, it's not an issue at all. You know, we're, we're agnostic on the model, Roxy. Uh, but what we're not agnostic on is the vision, the entrepreneurial nature, and the growth growth aspirations. And look, it would be absolutely remiss of me, given you know our previous conversations over the years, as far as you know, leveraging technology, not just in an advice production process, but to give the clients a real user experience. Is there any green shoots from your travels abroad 
that could be utilized in Australia? Or alternatively, is there any homegrown sort of great user pieces of technology that you're seeing currently? Uh, f- firstly, I'd say green shoots, yes. Um, you know, we, we discussed earlier in the in the conversation around the emerging professionalism of financial advisors, particularly in Australia. And again, I think it's worth reflecting that our emerging profession has only been going 20, 30, 40 years, um, you know, culminating from risk insurance, um, you know, solicitors, accountants, um, you know, stockbroking, et cetera. So this emerging present, uh, profession is slowly but surely getting there. Um, and, and it's the same with technology. Our, our tech's not perfect. Uh, my advice to any firm out there is, you know, don't don't waste too much time trying to find the ideal tech. Uh, you know, the firms that we're talking to, whether they're lending only, risk only, wealth only, uh, integrated wealth, tax accounting, whatever they might be, there are firms out there that are growing at 15% compound. There are firms out there running at 40 to 50% EBIT margins. Now, some of those firms have good tech. Some of those firms don't have good tech. They just have great systems and processes. So broadly, the industry and the emerging professions heading in the right direction. But you know, whilst, whilst I think we should be all exploring tech, uh, ideally through study groups and communities where we can swap and share ideas quite quickly rather than jumping on planes and spending too much time and money uh, you know, trying to uncover stones uh, all around the world. But I think it's important to keep considering tech but not to spend too much time in doing that. No problems. And so whilst I'm, whilst I'm, I'm sort of uh, absorbing um, the, the merchant um, philosophy and indeed what, what you've intimated, <clears throat> and you mentioned about people with long runway, I'm going to put to you another thing because, you know, this is ensemble. This is the positive evolution of financial advice. And we're going to have listeners here who are at all stages of their development. They could be the people who are talking to you, but they could also be the the future employers, uh, sorry, employees of those companies. When you co-partner with um, businesses, do you encourage things like employee share schemes for future talent or what's what's kind of the guiding principles to make sure that your current 45-year-olds don't become the white flaggers in 10 years. Yeah, so we, we, we are uh, massive believers in growth. Uh, we want to – I'm a huge believer in what I refer to as the three-legged stool, and that is the co-relationship between the clients, uh, between the team members. You know, I don't like calling them the staff, they're team members, and between the shareholders. You know, the minute you've got a three-legged stool where one of the legs get cuts off, gets cut off uh, – everyone loses. And so they need to uh, cohabitate. Um, it needs to be a great outcome for all of those. So uh, broadly, Roxy, you know, anything that we can do to help the boat go faster, to give a greater experience for clients, to give a greater experience for team members, and to give a great experience for shareholders, collectively, not for one over the other, um, is, is, is everything that we stand for at Mergent and everything that I've been trying to achieve in 33 years in my in my career to date. Well, you have achieved you have you have achieved quite quite a lot in in your career to date. And um, you mentioned you don't like talking about yourself, but um, I wanted to to thank you for coming on um uh, the podcast. This is the the engine room. Um, I'm trying to get a real feel for where the development of the industry are, but I'd also like to acknowledge that that you are one of the few people to receive the member of the Order of Australia for your services to financial planning um, as part of our Australia Day honours. Um, so congratulations. It's just wonderful to actually have positive, um, uh, positive recognition from, from the government. And when you received that a couple of years ago, um, did it come as a shock? And how does it make you feel to hold that? Because we don't have that many in our industry, mate. Well, thanks, Roxy. Um, look, again, it's, it's not something I, I necessarily like to talk about, but I'm incredibly proud. Um, it came as a, a huge surprise, um, an email out of the blue from the Governor-General's office um, probably nine months ahead of the awards saying that I'd been nominated and would I consider it. Of course, I was back to them in about um, three seconds saying yes. But it, it look, it, you look at some of the people, you know, there's 12,000 Australians uh, since the awards have been going in the late 70s that have achieved um, uh, an order of Australia and it, it makes you just feel incredibly proud, incredibly humble. Um, and incredibly grateful. I think why I wanted to sort of put that as a as a book or a, as a bookmark in this particular recording is that you, you went to great lengths to talk about 
you know, the, the, the normal PE style firms or even, even you know, the stereotype. And, 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 you know, it's fair to say that you as a person um, are very much, uh, you know, one in all in when it comes to working with these practices to achieve their goals. You, you, you've done that before. You've got a track record. You even identified basically people in who you invest in are very much people that you would you would also want to work for as well. Um, as far as the vision for the future of financial advice uh, in Australia and, and the role um, of the engine room or the people around the advisors, are you are you really bullish on it growing or do you think we're just going to have a more narrow range of people dealing with a larger client base? Look, I think we're, you're always going to have your I don't mean this to be derogatory, but you're always going to have your corner milk bar and your corner hardware store where people are running lifestyle businesses, two, three staff, they're happy not growing. Um, but in those situations, and they can be incredibly profitable businesses, unless you're offering a career for some of your team members, you will get staff turnover. And so then you look at the mid-tier and the larger tier, and you know I think the local corner milk bar is becoming more of the, the Coles and the Woolies. And so you're now in Australia today, you're probably seeing around 10 firms in Australia today that have got revenue north of $100 million. You know, you wouldn't have seen that five or seven years ago. So we're now starting to see this sort of mid-tier and large tier. Um, what I would say is there's no right or wrong. I believe in growth. Growth creates opportunities for all three of those stakeholders, that three-legged stool I spoke about. So I would say growth is the key. Growth is going to get you great outcomes for all three of those stakeholders, and I'd be encouraging people to try to focus on that. Sage advice, uh, indeed, David. Um, um, what we're going to do is we're going to put a, a bunch of links for anyone who's who's interested in just learning more. Obviously, don't ring uh, David's uh, phone um, night and day. Um, he's not he's not going to be prepared for that. But but if you if anything that we've said today resonates with you, um, please reach out and. You know, from from my perspective, from my personal perspective, um, thank you for spending some time today. From the perspective of Ensemble, why I got involved with Ensemble was it's a sort of place that I would have loved to have when I was in my first fifteen years, and and just having access to have honest conversations with people that have been there and done that um, is fantastic. And and you've definitely one of those uh, people, David. So um, I'd like to thank you very much for the podcast and the look forward to watching the progress of Merchant in Australia. Cheers, mate. Roxy, thanks for having me and thank you for everything you do and Insobble does to help the industry get better quicker. It's great. Cheers, mate.